went like one step further from that and i know sometimes when it comes to creating someone's content plan they would say okay we're going to need five blog posts we're going to do 10 white papers this year we will have 12 infographs um but i i think this gets very challenging when you can't really hit that quota but for someone who is actually sort of maybe revising their content plan um what kind of methodology would you recommend you know, I think uh, this is maybe an unpopular answer, but I find that with marketing, the answer for me is so often it depends. Um, I really try to be careful about making like prescriptions without necessarily yeah. knowing everyone's situation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're like, and that's why I tried to be honest about realistically, like, of course, we'd love to do all of these things, but we do have limitations in terms of how many people we may have, what our resources yeah. are and all of our priorities. Um, what I would say is, uh, my advice is always to, to test what you're doing. So before going all in, before I would say, here's our one year plan, I would request that you're using three to six months for testing so that you can see what works and then develop a plan based on what you know works. So I always like to see the first three to six months of any sort of content experiment is specifically to measure and see how it works and then build your plan from there. Um, the other thing I would do is uh, make sure you are setting those goals up front. So you mentioned like, you know, 10 white papers for this, eight, eight of that. Um, I, that is a great scenario. I find that what usually happens is sort of uh, the other end of the spectrum where it's like, we're just creating a bunch of things and we haven't really defined what is our goal with all of this content? What are we trying to accomplish? Because at the end of the day, there's nothing magical about 12 white papers versus 11 that's going to help you hit your sales goal, right? Yeah. Or help you, um, you know, raise your next round or whatever those priorities are. So I think getting really clear upfront on what those goals are so that you can select for your plan the content that's going to best support that goal. Um, I always tell this as an example, um, don't name the brand, but I was working with a brand um, and uh, they were super excited about virtual reality. They were right. like, we need to do virtual reality. We need it. It's innovative. It's the next great thing, right? Yeah. So. We helped them over the course of like two, three months, create this whole like VR app experience. And then after it launches, they said, okay, now how many impressions have we had? And we said, okay, well, here's how many, but um, here's what our engaged time is with this experience. And they said, well, our priority is reach. And I said, well, you definitely should have clarified that because, you know, virtual reality is not the easiest thing to distribute. You know, most people don't have a virtual reality headset. It's gonna be hard to accomplish reach with this, you know, this piece of content that's difficult to distribute. Yeah. And so sometimes we get almost like distracted by the shiny new thing. Like we're gonna do a TikTok every single day, or, <laughs> you know, we're gonna do a webinar once a week because it's like the new fancy thing, right? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you realize, oh man, that's not actually supporting our, our bigger long-term goal, or I just haven't connected it more closely enough to our long-term goal. So um, those, I know that's sort of a roundabout answer, but uh, those are the things that I would be looking at before making that plan. I would be looking at getting yourself some time to do some really clear testing to testing. inform your final plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I would um, also make sure you're really clear on your overall sales goals so you can connect all your activities to that broader business goal and make sure you're not just doing content for content's sake. That's true. I think anything is easy to justify when you tag it to a revenue or a sales goal, right? to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I know in your book, Melanie, um, in uh, the concept book framework, there are, you know, lots of cool and, you know, guides and ideas and like, you know, sort of, um, you know, frameworks and things that you talk about and how you can like think about various ideas, especially when you think you've got like writer's block and you don't know what you write about. Uh, yeah. But uh, like what kind of like strategies, even like, you know, even referencing your book, would you like recommend for someone when they want to get like started with something to write about their product? Yeah, so um, if you are looking for some sort of system, then the book may be a great fit for you. It yeah. essentially walks through um, a grid that helps guide yes. your brainstorm. So it gives you checklists of things to consider as you're coming up with ideas. And sometimes it's helpful just to have that list of options in front of you. Um, I think one of the challenges that a lot of marketers have is we see creativity as this like, magical free-spirited like no rules you know muse and luck and you know a light bulb moment we, we make it feel like it's random and special and magical um but really it is like any other skill and you need to practice it to be able to do it when you need it right to be mm -hmm. able to pull that creativity out when you need it um 
And you need structure in order to do that. So imagine, you know, I want to get good at basketball. I'm not just going to dribble around aimlessly, right? Like I'm going to practice dribbling. I'm going to practice free throws. I'm going to practice, you know, three point shots there. You have certain things that, you know, will help you get better at that, at that topic. And so I think with creativity, same thing, you want to have some sort of structure to guide you so that you're not just like sitting and thinking, like that's not necessarily going to get you to your end point. Yeah. Um, so like I said, the, the content field framework offers a structure. There may be another structure that works better for you, but I think having an understanding of what your goals are and what your limits are is really important. So just as like a tangible example, if you are saying we have a new product launch coming up or we're launching yeah. a new, you know, a new feature for our, for our site, we want to sit down and say, instead of saying like, what content can we create? Like get very specific, as specific as you can and say, okay, we want to teach our customers about why this new product is important. How could we teach them about that? Okay, well, we could teach them how to use it, right? Okay, that would be cool. How could we teach them how to use it? Oh, mm. maybe a video walkthrough, a screen share walkthrough would be great. Um, or, you, you know, backing up, okay, we want to uh, convince them that this new tier, this new feature is, is something that they need to upgrade to. So, okay, how do we demonstrate the benefits of this new thing? Well, why don't we tell the story of our beta group who tested it and had all these amazing results? But I think if you just sat down and said, like, we need content for our new thing, it's really difficult to know where to start because that includes like everything in the entire universe. Yeah. So those kind of specific prompts, um, will really help you get thinking in the right direction. And it's very similar. I, I make a lot of analogies because I think one of the challenges with content is so much of what we do is abstract. It's really yeah. difficult to, to visualize, but um, you think about, okay, what are we gonna have for dinner? It's always like a fight. It's always an, an extended conversation because there's like, there's no rules. Someone's talking about making something. Someone else is talking about ordering. Someone else is, we're going to go out to somewhere. And yeah. so you have all this very mismatched information. And so it's hard to come to consensus. So if you do have some guidance, okay, what are we ordering in? Suddenly it's a lot easier. You've narrowed down your options so that you can, you know, come up with an idea within those constraints. So finding those constraints, even though it seems like that's the opposite of creativity is actually one of the best things you can do for your brainstorm. I love that. Um, so once you do that and when you figure out you have like some pieces that you want to like distribute and stuff, yeah. what kind of metrics do you usually apply to know, okay, that piece worked? Mm, so again, it depends, right? Um, I think there's three primary categories of, of KPIs that we would be looking at. So uh, awareness, if your goal is just to reach a ton of people, maybe you're in the really early stage and that's just what's what's really important for you, um, then you're gonna wanna look at anything that indicates eyeballs. So that would be page views, impressions, um, you know, clicks, you know, anything that's sort of it just giving you the idea that someone saw this thing, you know, plays yeah. on your video, for example. Um, if you're looking for engagement, that's the second bucket. You're really trying to engage your customers. You want them to do something more than just look, um, you, you know, not just their eyeballs, but what did they think about after they saw it? Um, that's where you're going to be looking for anything that indicates consumer action. So I'd look for um, clicks, comments, mm -hmm. likes, replies. Um, if you're looking at a specific web page, you could look at time on site, time on page, scroll depth. Um, again, anything that indicates they didn't just see it. They actually hung around and thought about it a little bit. Uh, and then the, the third bucket of, of KPIs I'd look for would be if you're in a conversion mindset. So you're asking them not just to see the content, not just to think about it, but then to take some other action outside of the content. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to vary based on what your call to action is, but you could be, you know, uh, sales calls scheduled or downloads or signups or registrations or, you know, purchases, of course, you know, ordering tickets, making a reservation, whatever that is for you, um, you know, scheduling a demo. Um, so it's, those are sort of the, the three major buckets, I would say, like awareness, are we going for awareness, in which case we look for eyeballs? Are we going for engagement, in which case we look for some indication that they cared? <laughs> and yeah. then uh, is it conversion, in which case did they do the action we're, we're trying to get them to do? Okay, so in that, um, I'm just also wondering, you know, you'd want to, you'd have all your goals identified, then you look at like various channels as well. So I know that with, you know, you've 
social media channels, especially with things like TikTok, you know, you think that, wow, that's like a platform where you can, or people expect to see a lot of information within like 30 seconds or so. So I'm just wondering, you know, when you have things evolving like that, um, how much has like user behavior change? Are like long form written content still um, a thing? Because my practice is once you figure out a topic, my assumption is people still like various forms that create a video of the same thing something long form, a blog post, a summary, an infograph, all of that. So I have those various yeah. touch points. Should that still be a thing? For sure. So repurposing your content is one of the smartest things you can do. Um, not only because, again, we're all limited on resources. So the more you can get out of a single piece of work, the, the better you'll be. Um, but also, like you said, we have a lot of content channels we need to feed. And so repurposing allows you to, to show up in all those different places. Um, but the other thing that's important, I think, Sometimes we feel like we can't repurpose or we can't repost because like, well, they've seen that already. Yeah. But the important thing to remember is like, nobody sees everything that you post. Nobody, I promise you, no one sees everything you post. Only you because you're posting it, right? Yeah. Um, even if they did see everything that you post, they didn't click on it or engage with it just because they saw everything. And even if they did click on it, engage it, read it, watch it, they didn't take the desired action yet. They didn't learn what they were supposed to learn or finish that project or whatever it is, right? So sharing it again is great, right? So don't don't ever be afraid to repurpose or reshare or any of that stuff. Um, people will definitely gain value from it. Um, the other thing I just, like you mentioned, like is, is long form dead, right? It's like, I feel like a question that has, come up I mean I remember having that conversation in like 2013 like we're always afraid that it's dying um but I know that the the goldfish attention span thing has been disproved like that's one of those really uh difficult to extinguish rumors um mm -hmm. the great example of this is the amount of people who watched Game of Thrones yep I mean we're talking single episodes that are longer than an hour yeah. uh the number of people who binge watched Breaking Bad uh I mean tens hundreds of hours of a show right yeah. um people read harry potter and those books were doorstops right yeah. i mean people are not afraid of long-form content the only thing is there has to be enough payoff for them to stick around and keep reading keep listening keep watching so if you are going to create long-form content it really has to be value forward there has to really be a reason that someone's getting enough out of it to, to stick around and not go do something else so today, you know, we cover things like um, bringing that whole human aspect of things, um, offering to solve a problem for someone, testing, you know, your content before you go live with it um, and sort of constraining yourself because sometimes it looks like that seems to be the door to creativity. Um, I just, you know, I just wanted to, you know, what, since we covered all of that, I wanted to ask if there was one thing, like even product marketers like myself, can do to be better at content marketing starting, I don't know, tomorrow, what should it be? <laughs> starting tomorrow, um, I think we should start every content conversation with what does our audience get out of this? Right. I think that's something we often do as product marketers, we're thinking about the benefits. And I think sometimes when it comes to content, we can kind of revert back to what does this do for us? Yeah. And if that's one mindset shift you can make, if starting tomorrow, whenever you're gonna create a piece of content, what does our audience get out of this? That will guide you toward content that's much more useful and it will steer you away from content that is too self-serving to actually help you achieve your goals. Good. That was a really good one. Thank you, Molly, for this. There were <laughs> lots of gems there. And uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. It was awesome. Yeah, thanks for letting me share my story. <laughs>